Got new camera angles. Hi. <laughs> Say hello to the folks at home. <laughs>
So we light this candle to remind ourselves we gather in the name of Jesus, who is the light of the world, who calls us to be lights to the world. Um, let us worship God. already. Let's join in the call to worship. It's printed in the bulletins. I will say the light colored words if you will say the dark colored ones. In worship, may we be as welcoming as Sarah and Abraham who were quick to serve the stranger. In faith, may we proclaim that nothing is too big for God. In the moments of holy surprise, May we laugh with deep abiding joy, for God is in the holy surprise. God is in the winding path, and God is in our presence today. Let us worship holy God. And we continue all together in the prayer of confession. God of unexpected joy and answered prayers, we confess that sometimes things feel too good to be true while at other times we wonder if you hear us at all. When life unravels for the worst, we blame you. But when life unravels for the best, filling our days with holy surprise, we tend to praise ourselves, thinking we've earned this unexpected joy. Forgive us. Help us to see you in our midst. And with every breath that turns into a laugh, draw us closer to you. Amen. Hear the good news. God's love is stronger than anything. God's love is stronger than sin, stronger even than death. And we are forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to sing. We're going to sing out of the hardback Voices United, number 820. And the song is Make a Joyful Noise. And please stand as you are able.
transition back into what almost seems like normal again. We're also going to have scripture readers, so it's not just my voice the whole time. And Jane Shapley has graciously agreed to be our first, so I'm going to welcome Jane up. <laughs> as I come to, as I come to my God, something in free, there's some hymn about that. I'm shorter than you are. Yes, I'm shorter than I used to be. <laughs> oh, Rabbi. <laughs> Our first reading is from the book of Genesis. The readings today are two wonderful stories that you've heard over and over again, but never too many times. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. And he said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that, you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour needed and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a, pa a calf tender and good, and gave it to his servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself and saying, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now, Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The passage from Luke 
is one of many parables or stories that Jesus was telling the people who traveled with him. And here are a couple of them. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me! for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. So through most of August, we have been exploring a little late summer series called Unraveled, Seeking God When Our Plans Fall Apart. And some of you might remember that I talked at the beginning of this series about how I bought this lovely resource in 2019, thinking it was really rich and interesting and had lots to explore. And then the world fell apart with COVID and everything that followed that. And so I brought it back and we've been looking at being unraveled through a number of different stories. We've looked at being unraveled by uncertainty and the story of how Peter started to walk on the water, jumped out of a boat, he started walking on the water like wily e. Coyote until he realized what he was doing and began to sink. And we explored how the hard-heartedness of humans unravel God's dream for justice and abundance for all with the story of Pharaoh and Moses and the plagues. How to go on with life when our dreams and expectations unravel with the words of Prophet Jeremiah encouraging the exiled people to pray for the welfare of the city that took them to exile. Pray for the welfare of Babylon. And I saved this one for last for this little series. After working through uncertainty and hard-heartedness and exile, I really felt called to today's topic, unraveled by joy. Unraveled by joy. How could something that we see as so positive be unraveling? And I confess that part of the reason I kept this one for last is that I really struggle with this story. I have a hard time with the entire narrative of Abraham and Sarah for lots of different reasons. But the miraculous birth after a lifetime of infertility, that's a tough one on a lot of levels. But the Gospel reading from Luke that is actually assigned for today's lectionary, it's got nothing to do with the series, it's perfect for this topic. It's all about joy. And so I really just felt called to get over my own discomfort and explore it. So Abraham and Sarah are really old. They're really, 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 really old. <laughs> really old, none of you here got, well, maybe a couple are close, but not, you're old, they're old. <laughs> 
They were old when God told them to pack up all their goods and their livestock and their family and their staff to move to a place where I will tell you. And they go. They are wealthy, they are respected, they have status, they have position, they have everything they could possibly want in life except children. And so where we pick up the story, when the angels, or maybe even God in person, tells them that Sarah will get pregnant, and Sarah laughs. And they even name the child Isaac, which means laughter. So the resource, and really most commentaries that I ever read about this story, they say that Sarah laughs because of delight and joy and happiness. And I know these commentaries have got to be written by men. <laughs> I've always thought the laughter was denial, and disbelief, and maybe a little terror. I'm a bit of an older parent myself. I was at 99, but I'm older. And the story of Abraham and Sarah, it's, it's complex, and it's, it's messy, and it is often cringeworthy. But it's always, 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 always moving toward the promise that they have embraced, that God will make them the ancestor of a nation, a nation more numerous than the stars. So it's a story of trusting God, even when the promise seems absolutely impossible. It's a promise that's repeated over and over and over again. And it's a realization that comes usually by women like Sarah and Hannah and Mary. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. In the Sanctified Art, the authors of this series, they write, laughter is a biblical way of receiving a newness which cannot be explained. A newness is a sheer gift, underived, undeserved, unwarranted. So how does this connect with the idea of unraveled? How does joy unravel us? The others, lament, exile, uncertainty, doubt, injustice, hard-heartedness, they all seem pretty clear examples of how life has unraveled. But joy, laughter, delight, celebration. And I mentioned I've had this resource for three years now, and it wasn't until I read it in conjunction with the gospel reading from today that it finally starts to make sense to me. Joy is lovely. Joy is something we look forward to, right? It's good. It's joy. Joy is something deep. Joy is something natural and real. It can't be manufactured. It can't be faked. It comes from the depths of your soul. It is deeper than happiness. It is bigger than contentment. It's so much more than words can describe can only be experienced. So I want you to take a moment right now, just think to yourself about a time or two in your life when you felt joy. Just hold, hold those memories of joy in your mind's eye right now. And now remember the two little stories that Jesus told. A man with a hundred sheep, he loses one, and he leaves the other 99 and searches in the wilderness for the one who is lost. And a woman has 10 silver coins, and she loses one of them, and, and she lights the lamp and sweeps the house and searches until she finds it. And both of them, both of them, the man who is rich enough to own a hundred sheep, the woman who only has 10 silver coins, when they find the one that is lost, what is their response? Joy. Rejoice with me. A joy so big they can't just experience it by themselves. They call their friends, they invite the neighbors, they have a party so others can share the joy. Rejoice with me. And then the story that immediately follows this passage is the prodigal son. A child who insults his father, takes his money, runs off to the city, and loses it all on wine, women, and song, and then comes home. And the father's reaction? Joy. Rejoice with me. He throws a party. He invites the friends. He invites the neighbors. He even invites his eldest son who is out sulking in the field. And here's the unraveling part. Here's the unraveling part. Jesus is telling these stories in response to the criticism of the righteous and the holy. 
the leaders, the respected teachers of the community. They are trying to shame and discredit Jesus by saying that he spends way too much time with sinners and tax collectors and all those outcasts and degenerates. And not haranguing or correcting or shaming or, or scolding these people. Instead, he spends his time eating and drinking and partying with them. One of the common complaints of the scribes and the Pharisees is that Jesus is a glutton who is always showing up to the feast. He's always at the party. He's turning water into wine. He's turning bread and fish into a feast and then inviting thousands to come and have lunch. He's always inviting himself over for a meal and usually at the houses of all the wrong kinds of people. And in response to this criticism, this complaint, Jesus, you're a glutton, you're hanging out with the wrong people. Jesus tells stories about lost sheep, lost coins, and God rejoicing. One of my very favorite commentaries, The Salt Project, puts it this way. Accordingly, the good news is for sinners. The good news is for sinners, not former sinners. God doesn't love us because we've picked ourselves up by our bootstraps. That's the opposite of the gospel. Rather, God loves us even if, even if we're wayward lambs who've wandered into danger, even if we're coins lying forlorn under a dresser, even if we've utterly lost our way, collaborating with empire as a tax collector. How could God love us in this apparently unfair, extravagant, even if sort of way? Because mercy isn't fair. And God's love is merciful, like a kind-hearted parent caring for a child, or a sweet saving word, as the old hymn has it, for a wretch like me. Properly understood then, the church isn't primarily a circle of moral excellence and respectability. You are not a circle of moral excellence and respectability. Rather, it's primarily a circle of joy, of celebration, of reveling in what God, a God of grace and mercy, has done, is doing, and will yet do. Moral excellence has its place, of course, but it's decidedly second place. What comes first is the party, the singing, the joy on earth as it is in heaven. Rejoice with me. So what's unraveled here is dogma, is exclusion, is the belief that God will only love us if we're acceptable, if we have our act together, if we're following the right and narrow way. And there are enough places in this world, in this media, in life, that are very quick to tell me that I am not good enough. I am not smart enough. I am not pretty enough. I am not quiet and well-behaved enough. Whatever enough. That a church is only successful if we are packed to the rafters with the right kind of people who are righteous and respectable. And this is unraveled. This is unraveled by the teachings of Jesus that God will search for us when we are the one lost. God will come down into that wilderness place, into the dark hiding places, into the lost and lonely ways where nothing makes sense. That God's mercy and love and rejoicing is for us right where we are. Not when we're some kind of idealized perfect, but right here, right now, in the midst of life, in all of its messy complicatedness. Going back to the story of Sarah and Abraham, they were complicated, they were messy, they were fallen people, and God chose them to be the ancestors of the faith. And if God loves them, then surely God loves me. How would life be different? How would we be different? How would this church be different if we let that joy that God takes in the ordinary and the lost and the fallen and the unsure and let that joy unravel all the expectations and stereotypes? If we are a church that is not primarily a circle of moral excellence and respectability, but instead primarily a circle of joy, celebration, of reveling in what the God of grace and mercy has done, is doing, and will do. We would unravel everything, 
everything that keeps us from proclaiming the message that you are loved. You are loved. Just as you are. Right here. Right now. Come. Rejoice with me. You are loved. Now what are you going to do to join in God in that celebration? Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's sing. Sing that old Joyful, joyful, we adore you. Number 232. chair support you. Take a deep breath and let's pray. Steady and comforting God, with you every transition and new start is a reminder of your goodness. For you are always creating fresh, amazing things in us and through us. Though we are sad about summer ending, we are grateful for this start of a new season, especially this year. 
After all we've faced and overcome and released with the past couple of years of COVID, we come to this year changed with new levels of gratitude, and hope, and connection carved in us. We appreciate the opportunity to learn and grow, knowing it is one of the biggest privileges we have. And the gift of physically being with friends and neighbors, teachers, feels like a holy hug. With thanks and love, we now offer everything we are to you, asking for your blessing. We pray as and for students of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds. We pray for our hearts and all they hold, excitement and nervousness, disappointment and hope. We give you all our loves and fears. We pray for steady self-esteem and deepening resilience. Loving God, hear our prayers, and in your love, answer. We pray for our minds, that they will expand in wonder and celebration, learning not just from books studied, but from the people beside us. Open our minds with a willingness to be changed in unexpected ways, and settle our thought loops in peaceful places. We pray for our hands, that they will reach out to help, welcome, and care. Bless our hands with patience and dedication as they grip pencils and type on keyboards, swish paintbrushes and clap in song, grip monkey bars and lunchbox hand box handles, spin wheelchair tires and basketballs. Holy God, hear our prayers. And in your love, answer. We pray for our mouths, that they will speak words bringing life and connection. Help us use our mouths to honor the dignity and belovedness of all. Remind us to open our mouths for deep belly breaths when we're feeling anxious or afraid. We pray for our feet, that they will move toward those different from us, and help others in safe ways. Plant our feet next to those who feel alone. Bless our steps down hallways and sidewalks. We know you are with us wherever our feet go or stay. Holy God, hear our prayers and in your love answer. We pray for our eyes, that we may see ourselves and others with compassion. Point our eyes toward those who are forgotten or struggling. Grow us in flexibility to see from all kinds of angles. Bless what and how we see, whether we're looking at a screen, a whiteboard, the beauty of a person's face and help us see with the most important eyes, the eyes of the Spirit within us. We pray for our ears, that they will genuinely listen to all voices, especially those who haven't been listened to much. When things get noisy, help us listen extra carefully for your voice. Help us to hear with the most important ears, the ears of the Spirit within us. Holy God, hear our prayers, and in your love, answer. We say a special prayer for parents, as the start of the new school year is always another leap of faith. Wrap them with your reassuring love as they entrust their children and trust in you. When questions remain unanswered, and the realm of control is finite. Bless them with peace and the promise you are right there with their child, whether heading to preschool or driving to college. And we pray for teachers and staff and administrators. Bless these faithful servants with courage and confidence, knowing you are in their classroom with a steady hand on their shoulder. Give them peace, patience, 
and balance in the pressures they face, and bravery to build structures and systems which justly serve all your children. Give them delight to the young ones before them, and recognition of the sweet ways children are also teachers. Holy God, hear our prayers, and in your love, answer. Can we pray for ourselves? With the sighs of our hearts that are too deep for words. Loving God, we pray for health and wholeness, fun and growth, surprise and amazement for this season ahead, knowing you will hold us all, all the way through. Loving God, hear our prayers, and in your love, answer. I think we might wait on the hymn. Let's do the hymn right before the blessing. Feels like a blessing kind of hymn. And as we come back into this space, I wonder if anybody has anything to talk about the life and work of the congregation. Terry. Wait, come on up. Come on up. <laughs> We don't have Kleenex up here. I don't. <sighs> Hi. It's actually my birthday today. <gasps> Happy birthday! <laughs> and I'm here to have a birthday because I'm also three years sober. Yay! 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 On that too. Oh, I get applause for that. <laughs> that one I heard. Of course. Um, this congregation is part of that. This community has welcomed me. It's a thing I talk about with you folk because it's important to invite people in, to ask people in, and you have done so. So, small gesture, big gesture, but thank you. Yes, I'm going. Okay. okay. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> it's both birthdays. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. last week. As you know, in 1952, uh, King George VI died and Princess Elizabeth was in Africa at the time. Since, since then, she immediately became the, our uh, Queen of England and of Canada. And um, for that reason, uh, since she died this last week, I thought we, ought, we should recognize this annual bell ringing team has really been practicing. Uh, <laughs> we decided to do it this morning. <laughs> been practicing. We are going to ring 70 chimes on the bell wow. simply to recognize the 70 years of absolutely amazing service that our Queen has given to the country and to the Commonwealth. Yeah, I was all teary about, uh, come on up, Mary, about the Queen, because I don't know, I connected to my mom, too. My mom was, was born in England and um, just always spoke so highly of the fact that the royal family stayed in London with everybody during the bombing and, 
I mean, Elizabeth was just, whatever you think about colonization and colonialism and empire and everything else, Queen Elizabeth was a model of a woman who was strong and had integrity and served. Like she, she understood what service was and she lived it her whole life. And so I can't see any of her kids following in those footsteps, but maybe they will. So yeah, don't come for me and not treasonous. <laughs> I mentioned something. Yeah, it's such right. a wonderful thing. Um, we were um, in, in a place where the Queen came and she walked by everybody and she talked, stopped and talked to us. Oh. And we lived in Edinburgh and we knew she was going to Edinburgh the next day. And we asked her how she would go and she said, Oh, by train. I love train. <laughs> I guess I should quietly, re or well, not quietly, but anyway, um, just mention about the Queen. Um, when I, in 1956, when she came to Victoria, the one thing she always asked for was all the Cub Scouts, brownies, and guides to be there for her to almost like we had to stand in a row and be inspected. And that particular year, somebody in the organization of it, um, we all lined up in what is now seen as West Shore Parkway intersection of the highway where you'd never want to stand out there today. <laughs> but in those days, it was a little two-lane two road that went up over the Malahat. And um, I stood there and this car went whoosh by. <laughs> And apparently, by the time that she got to Nanaimo, she found out that we were all standing there waiting for her, and she actually called us back to the Empress Hotel the following weekend so that she could meet us, and they had to change her entire itinerary because she, was, she felt like she had let us down. And then, in the inspection, she actually commented on how polished my brownie pin was. <laughs> You never ever forget. <laughs> it was very, very special. But anyway, um, I just want to mention I know coffee time has been very sporadic here over the summertime. If we haven't had volunteers step up, there hasn't been coffee. There will be coffee today and homemade cookies and ice cream with a chocolate sauce on top if you wish to have it. Sunday, so Sunday. I will be leaving now to go and get that out. I think I'm going to bring it out onto our new deck. If you've seen our new deck outside the doors, it's the easiest place to serve from. And so we will have that for anybody who would wish to stay after. So thank you. <laughs> so and a special thank you to Marion, because I, I, I don't know what happened. I'm like, yeah, of course, Sunday, Sunday's for the whole congregation. And then I get a phone call saying, you know, it's usually just for the Sunday school, right? <laughs> oh, can we make it for the whole congregation? And Marion said, Yes. So, stay for ice cream. And Ray. Robbie is with the children today, so I just wanted to mention that the card, there's a card circulating around to be signed. It's for Laurel, our office administrator. She is moving to Kelowna. I don't think she's overly happy with having to move to Kelowna, but her husband accepted a posting there and he'll be doing more outreach work. So, she will be leaving the island for a short time. So if you haven't signed it, try and do so after church. George, come on up. Uh, so the long wait, I think it's been several months now we've been talking about the fact that we have a preschool who will be starting up. So that is actually happening this week. It didn't happen last week. So this week we'll be seeing uh, kids here. So if you come to visit, drive carefully. <laughs> uh, this next ce latest celebrating around is out. This is our is it quarterly. How often does this come out? This is our quarter. This is our regular magazine of the congregation. It's got lots of stories, thoughts, articles, poetry, photographs. It gives a good sense of who we are. It's got a really special guest editorial this week, this year, this time. Um, so yeah, it's available, it's online, there's some copies in the back. Um, 
trying to remember if there's anything else that I'm supposed to be announcing. Council's meeting this week. Yeah, it's the start of a new life. All right, are we going to do the 70 bells now? We can do it as we believe. Okay. Well, we got another hymn. Or should we do What do you think? Are people anxious to go or do you want to sit for the 70 bells? All right, so feel free if you need to leave, you can, if you want to get the first one line of ice cream. We're going to ring the bell 70 times, we're going to sing Go Out With Joy, and then we're going to read the affirmation of faith as our blessing on the way. That's what's going. So, bell ringers, who's going to count? Okay. Save the king. <laughs> we're going to sing. We're going to sing 884, You Shall Go Out With Joy.
Sower, thank you. I believe in God, the great Sower, who weaves us together in community, collecting our loose ends and turning them into belonging. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who hems us in before and behind, catching us when we fall and writing us into God's holy narrative. And I believe in Jesus Christ, who loved and claimed the people society had thrown out, refusing to disregard anyone as scrap. I believe God has woven us as part of God's self into the fiber of our being, making us inherently worthy of love and belonging. I believe the fabric of my life is weak, that I am prone to error and need God's handiwork to remind me of love. I believe in the church and that like a quilt of different fabrics, she is designed to be as diverse and beautiful as God's creation. And I believe that when life unravels, God is there to stitch my wounds together, to hold me in the palm of God's hand, to tell me of love, and to invite me into the as, as we go on that journey, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look on you with kindness and bring you peace.